The Apostle Paul warned about a time when people will drift away from sound teaching of the word and listen to preachers of fables and things that people want to hear. The antidote to such a drift is for faithful ministers who will preach the word in and out of season. Revelation chapter 12 verse 11 says, And they, God's people, overcame him, that's the adversary, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So they overcame God's people. This verse is telling us how God's people overcome the adversary, overcome the enemy. It says, we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. That means we testify, we must say with our mouth, we must affirm or give testimony with our mouth to what the blood of the Lamb has done for us. And when we testify to that, the Bible says we overcome the adversary. We overcome the enemy. And this is so powerful because it's the blood of Jesus that is the redemption price. That is our redemption. That's what brought us out of darkness into God's marvelous light. The blood. The price he paid on the cross. And so whenever we testify to that, we say with our mouth what the blood of Christ has done for us. It says, we overcome. It puts us over. Gives us victory. Helps us conquer and overpower the enemy. So I want to encourage you and I to do this. To take advantage of God's mechanism, if you will, of how to overcome the adversary in our lives. So the enemy is going to come against us in various ways, various areas. Uh, we'll talk about this in detail in the month of July and August, how the enemy tries to attack us in the realm of the soul and in our body. And, 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 and there's so many ways the enemy tries to cripple the believer. But we testify, we speak, we say what the blood of the Lamb has done for us. And it says we overcome the adversary that way. Amen? So let's stand up to our feet this morning as we make our declaration. This is our testifying to what God has done for us. And we're going to say it loud, bold, and strong. We don't apologize and we don't hold back. We say it loud, bold, and strong. Let's do this together. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by his word. Christ is my master. And to him, I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Just turn around to the person next to you, please. Shake hands, say hello, smile at them. Give them your name. And uh, you may be seated. Yeah, before we get into God's word, I just, uh, just want to release a word, and uh, it's, a, it's a little strange word, so I, I'm just going to release it as best as I know how. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but sometimes the Lord says certain things, and I just have to release it. And I just, here's what, I, you know, while I was worshiping, I just felt the Lord put, him, put before me the fact that there could be somebody here, and you're part of a group, and I see four, four other people involved, uh, but you've just been convicted of something, right? So I'm not going to ask you to stand up. It's not here to embarrass you. But you're in that situation. You, maybe along with four others, you're part of the four. Uh, you've been convicted. You're in a bad situation right now. But I just feel the Lord wants to release to you, tell you that God's going to redeem you out of that. He's going to bring you out of that. And uh, so if you're seated this morning and this applies to you, 
I want you to receive that word. And if you want to meet me privately, you can just come. Uh, just speak to me here afterwards. I'll pray with you. But what I feel the Lord wants us to release to you is God will bring you out of it. He will redeem you. Right? So just take that. Sometimes these words are very strange. I remember several years ago, we were having a, one evening meeting. And right after worship, I came and suddenly God gave me a word. He said, somebody has come here from the police station and you've had this, this happen. But that service, I said, would you identify yourself? And there was a young man. He had just walked in at the end of worship and he was actually coming straight from the police station. And he walked up front and we prayed and ministered to him. And so sometimes God does those words. I know it's a little embarrassing. We don't want to embarrass people. But I think uh, God just wants to minister to people and, and, and let them know that he's very aware of their situation. And, and, um, and, and, and you know, he's going to deliver them. He's going to redeem them. And so uh, I've just, re just released that word. If there's somebody here who identifies with it, uh, you're welcome to meet with me afterwards. Let's go to 2 Timothy, please. 2 Timothy and the fourth chapter. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And uh, we will read through 2 Timothy chapter 4 and then spend some time um, just drawing some lessons from this chapter. We've been studying First and 2 Timothy over the last several Sundays. And uh, we're closing out now. This is the last chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul is writing to Timothy, a son in the faith, whom he has spent time, maybe about 17 to 18 years, nurturing. And then he has released him to take care of the church in Ephesus. Uh, Paul, after appointing Titus uh, in Crete and Timothy in Ephesus, he makes his way back to Rome. Along the journey, he pauses and he writes two epistles, 1 Timothy and Titus. And then he goes back to Rome where he's imprisoned a second time. And this time, uh, he's probably worse off than his first. Uh, his first time, he was under house arrest, which was, okay, somewhat comfortable. But this time, he's put in prison. He's imprisoned in dungeon. And, you know, the conditions could have been bad. But he's in prison. And from prison, he writes his last letter, epistle to Timothy, that second Timothy. And we are in the concluding part of that letter. So obviously, these are his final words. And so, if you and I were to write our final words, we would choose our words very carefully. We would make it a point to say the most important things, the things that we feel like really, you know, if, we, if you don't get anything else, Make sure you get this, right? So I, I think it's, it's a lot that we can draw out of this chapter. It's a very small chapter, and yet it's very important. So let's read through that. Second Timothy chapter 4, we're going to read from verse 1 onwards. Paul writes, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, and your afflictions do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am, ready, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid out for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who, lo who have loved his appearing. Be diligent to come quickly. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. 
and has departed for Thessalonica, Christians for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with, left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that the message might be preached fully through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erasus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in my latest sake. Do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greets you as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. So the final words from Paul the Apostle. Verses 1 and 2, very important. He says, Timothy, here's my charge. Here's my final admonition, my charge to you, Timothy. Because it's really important and I'm charging you before the Lord. It's not just a polite you know, encouragement. And I'm really, this is serious. I believe God is what, the Lord is watching me as I charge you. What I want you to do, verse 2, preach the words in season and out of season. When it's convenient and it's not convenient. And things are easy and things are not easy. Preach the words. And as you preach the word, you convince, that is, you bring conviction, persuasion, assurance of the hearts of people. You rebuke, which means to lovingly correct, bring correction in the lives of people. You exhort, which means to encourage, motivate, inspire people. But do this with all long suffering and teaching. That means you be very patient in your teaching as you do this. So very important. Final words to Timothy. Timothy, you preach the word. You stay with the ministry of the word of God. Yesterday, uh, you know, we just spent some time with you. And I did one session in the morning. Uh, and this whole thing about discovering God's purpose. We're speaking to them out of, of, out of our book, Fulfilling God's Purpose. And just sharing nine signposts that God uses to guide us. That book was written in 1993. The first time I started preaching that was in 1992. And it just hit me yesterday as I was preparing. It's 24 years. 24 years and I've been preaching the same thing when it comes to that topic, that subject. Talking to people on how to discover the purpose of God, how to recognize God's purpose. 24 years. But every time you're, you're, you're speaking to a new audience, you're speaking to a new set of people who have not heard it, who need to know and uh, be encouraged in, in, in pursuing the purpose of God. And uh, so I was just reflecting on it. Wow. The same word, the same message over and over again to so many different audiences since 1993. But getting back to what we hear, Paul is saying here, he's saying, Timothy, I want you to stay with teaching the word. Keep teaching people, keep instructing people. And be patient when you do that. Because we all know we're not going to get it the first time. And so what you do is you repeat it. You keep listening again. You hear it again. You hear it again, and you are patient and just bringing back the same truths. Try bringing it to them in different ways and, and presenting the same truth in different 
methods and ways, and, but teach the word, preach the word. And from the word, you exhort, you convince, you bring correction to God's people. And be patient as you do this. Why? Because he says in verses 3 and 4, here's what's going to happen. Because the time will come, he said, that people would not be interested in sound doctrine. They're no longer going to be interested in sound teaching from the Word. And instead, they would like to listen to people who will tickle their ears. <laughs> and make them happy and make them feel good about what they hear. And they're going to flock to these kinds of teachers. And they're going to heap up these kinds of teachers. And they're going to refuse the truth. That's verse 4. They're going to refuse the truth and instead embrace fables. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to man-made stories. So Timothy, you're going to see this happen. There's going to be a movement. There's going to be a shift of people wanting to hear things that make them feel good rather than being attentive to sound teaching from the Word. They want to replace the truth with nice stories, fables, man-made stories. So, Timothy, it's so important for you to keep preaching, teaching the Word of God. Just stay with that. That's why he says there in the next verse, in verse 5, he says, But you be watchful in all things. I mean, you be careful. You do the, you endure afflictions. You stand through tough times, hardships. You endure it. Do the work of an evangelist. That means you keep speaking the good news of Jesus Christ. And you fulfill your ministry. You complete your ministry. You complete the assignment God's given you. Don't let these things hap happening around you sway you. And honestly, if you are looking across Christian Germany, you're scanning across what's happening cr across Christian Germany around the world, and you will find this whole thing of of, of churches and, and preachers wanting to preach messages that really you're, you have to search to find. I mean, did they quote anything from the Bible? <laughs> did they say anything that came from the scriptures? You got to search really hard. But it's very motivational. It's very inspiring. Makes you feel good. You feel really pumped up at the end of the service. But what did Paul say? Listen, you've got to preach the, the word. You don't replace the word with man-made stories, with fables. Even if they have mass appeal, even if they have a good market. <laughs> now, stay with the word. Preach the word. Now just think about the dangers. What would happen if we replace the truth with fables? If we replace sound doctrine with things that please people's ears? What will happen? Just try to think about it. We would lose out on everything that God wants to bring into our lives through his word. Because God works by his word. He works through his word. And there's so much the Bible tells us that the Word of God does for you and me. Right? It says that, you know, Acts 20 verse 32 says, This Word will build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. It's the Word that purifies. It's the Word that refines. It's the Word that brings about change in our lives. And the moment we replace the Word and just take it out and put in, you know, good stories or man-made things. We are losing out on the very thing God wants to use to bring change in our lives. So what kind of a church would we end up without the Word of God? A very weak church. You may have an excited church, but don't confuse excitement with strength. 
Don't confuse energy with power. You can have a high energy event. That doesn't mean people have got power on the inside. Because the true test of power is when you're out there, when the rubber meets the road. So, Paul says, Timothy, a time like that is coming, but I want you to stay true to the word. You preach the word, and you watch yourself. You fulfill your assignments. And then he brings some things out of his own personal life. This is verses 6 through 8. He says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. So he says, Timothy, I know I'm going to be sacrificed. My life is going to be offered up. Death is imminent now. I'm in prison under Nero. I know my departure is at hand. The time of my departure is at hand. But there is such a sense of completeness, such a sense of satisfaction. Look at the words he says. He says, I have fought a good fight. There's a deep sense of accomplishment. I have finished the race. Sense of completion. I have kept the faith and fulfilled. And there's a sense of expectation. There's a crown laid up for me. Which the Lord will give to me. That's wonderful. I don't know when our last days are going to. I mean when each one of us will step into our last day. But I hope that. All of us. Could say like the apostle Paul. I have fought. A good fight. I have. Finished. My course. I've done what God wanted me to do. I have kept the faith. And I'm looking forward to that reward that he is going to give to me. Amen. But that's going to happen one day at a time. Right? Don't reserve it to, you know, like you cram before exams. <laughs> we can't do that in, with life. You try to cram up everything the last year of your life. Can't do that. It's going to take one day at a time. Each day you live. In a way that when the race is over, you and I will be able to say these things. I fought a good fight. I've finished my race. I've kept the faith. And I'm ready to meet the Lord to receive the reward he has for me. Verse 9. Verse 9 through 11. He shares some personal things. He tells Timothy, be diligent to come to me quickly. So he wants Timothy to try and get to Rome from Ephesus as soon as he could. Show, show, shows his affection, his need for friendship, genuine friendship. And then he says in verse 10, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, and Titus for Dalmatia. So he's saying, okay, some of my co-workers have left. But unfortunately, there's one man, Demas, and his reason for leaving me is because he has been drawn by the world. Now, when we read about Demas in another, another places in Colossians 4.14 and in Philemon 1.24, you read that Demas was one of Paul's fellow workers. He was an associate of the Apostle Paul. So he traveled with Paul. He was ministering with Paul. He must have seen all the wonderful things God was doing through the Apostle Paul and was helping and serving in the ministry. Now, can you imagine such a man? Paul says, He has forsaken me, having loved the world. That's a serious warning for all of us. If a man who was an associate of the Apostle Paul could feel the pull of the world so strong that he would say, okay, for whatever reason, I mean, I'm, I'm going. Paul, you're on your own. Sorry. If a man who was an associate could feel such a pull, I think there's a warning for you and me. We've got to be on guard. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, and I think it's verse 12. Let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. 
You think you're standing great, but you still stay on guard, lest you fall. So none of us can say, you know, I'm totally immune to the pull of the world. Hey, as long as you and I are in it, we've got to stand guard, stand on guard. We don't want to end up like Demas. That at some point we feel the attraction, the pull of the world so strong that we abandon our assignment, our life assignment in serving God and get pulled away. No. Stand guard. Stay alert. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So that's a sad account there of Demas. Now we don't know what happened to this man. We don't know what what his end was. We don't know whether he stayed in the faith or whether he wandered away from the faith. We don't know. But the fact that he forsook the apostle Paul just being drawn by the world is a, a sad account of what happened. And then he says in verse 11, only Luke is with me. Get Mark. Bring him with you for he is useful to me for ministry. Now that's in interesting. Because if you go back in time, almost 24 years prior, or 20 years prior, when Paul left on his first missionary journey in Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas went together, and Barnabas took his nephew John Mark with them. So they traveled. So they left Antioch, came to the seaport town of Caesarea, and then from there they sailed to Cyprus, they came on the east coast of Cyprus and they, then they went all around to the west coast. By the time they reached the west coast of Cyprus, John Mark said, boy, this is enough. <laughs> Mission trips is not for me. <laughs> and so he quit and he said, I'm going back home. Now, Paul did not forget that. So later on, when Paul decided to go on a second missionary journey, this is in the end of Acts 15, he says, Barnabas, let's go again. Let's go on another mission trip, missionary journey. Barnabas says, sure, let's go, but I want to take my nephew, John Mark. Paul says, no, not that boy. <laughs> not that boy. Can't take him. And the Bible says the contention between Paul and Barnabas was so strong that they actually split. Barnabas took John Mark and sailed to their hometown, Cyprus, the home, the home place that they sailed there to Cyprus. But Paul took Silas and he went up north into Antioch and then over into uh, Turkey and continued on mission. So they split there. So now this is, you know, several years later, several years later, maybe 12 plus years after all of that happened. And Paul is writing now and says, bring Mark because he is useful to me in the ministry. So obviously in that time period of 12 plus years, things have changed. Barnabas must have really trained uh, John Mark or Mark trained him up and, you know, he must have come up to speed and started serving God and doing very well. And Paul must have received news. Hey, that young man who jumped ship back then, he's doing pretty good. He's doing well. And so he says, bring him. It gives us a message. We shouldn't hold people's past against them. Right? They may have failed some. And we all have done some things, silly things in the past. But it's so redeeming to know that when it's so redeeming to, when, when people don't look at us based on our past, but they look at us based on what God has done from then till now and for who we really are today. It's so redeeming. And we must learn to do that with each other. Sure, if you look at, you know, five years old, five years, they did this, five, so okay, that was, that was past. Maybe they were immature, maybe they didn't have the skill, maybe they didn't have the understanding, and so they made mistakes then. But who are they today? 
What has happened in their lives? Has God transformed them? Has God changed them? Uh, have they matured? And, and look at them for who they are today. And then, you know, reach out, do what you can to relate to them based on who they are today. Amen? That's what Paul does. And just to think that this is towards the end. It's like, you know, I know my end is near. I just want to let John Mark know that I appreciate him today. Even though some years ago, I said no to him. I want him to know. I recognize what's taken place in his life. And I want to do it before my end. And so we go on from there. Verses 12 to 15, he's giving some words to um, Timothy. He says, you know, Tychicus is on his way to Ephesus. He's coming to meet you. Bring the cloak that I left behind. So maybe winter is coming. Things are cold. He says, you know, I want the cloak. And it's interesting. He says, bring the books and the parchment. So Paul liked to read, liked to, you know, engage in that. So he says, bring the books, bring the parchments. And he tells Timothy, you know, be careful of this man, Alexander the coppersmith. You know, he opposed us and he greatly resisted us. You stay away from him. A simple message there. Stay away from people who oppose you. Don't waste your time. And you know, don't try to defend yourself. Just, just go on doing what God wants you to do and don't, don't waste time there. Verse 16 through 18. He says, at my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Now think about that. So Paul is reflecting on what took place two years prior. When he was first in prison in Rome. And you know he waited in Rome for two years. Finally his turn came. And he was brought before Nero. He was put on trial. And when he was put on trial. Paul says. All forsook me. No one stood with me. Now, what would your reaction be if you were in Paul's place? And you found that, hey, all the people who were your close associates, your close friends, people that you traveled with, who worked with you, in the moment of your greatest trial, no one's around. They all forsook me. Normal response would be to hold some resentment, hold something against these people. But what does Paul say? May it not be charged against them. Meaning nothing against them. My heart is clean. A very important lesson. That you and I need to keep our heart even Towards those who may not have stood with us when we really needed them. They abandoned. They ran away. They didn't stand with us. But a lesson to learn from the Apostle Paul. He says, I don't want it to be held against them. Nothing against them. Forgiven. Amen. You see, when you and I hold resentment. Resentment, of course, leads to hatred. And hatred leads to all kinds of other things like rebellion and uh, animosity and doing all those kinds of things. If we hold those grudges in our hearts towards people who, may have, may, you know, who didn't meet our expectation in some way, it's only going to affect us, not them. They may not even realize what they've done. They may not know. Sometimes they may, sometimes they may not. But if we have the grudge, if we have the resentment, it's only affecting me, only affecting us, not them. And so, a lesson to learn from the Apostle Paul. Let it go. Tell your neighbor, let it go. <laughs> Just let it go. Don't hold on to it. Right? Don't charge them with their failure or mistake, or lack of meeting an expectation that you had. But look at what Paul testifies. He says in verse 17, But the Lord stood with me. He says, you know, when nobody else stood with me, 
God was there. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me. God gave me the strength. God was there. When I had to stand alone, God was with me. He strengthened me. And what else did he do? Through me, while I was on trial, he made sure the gospel went all across in that courtroom. So that the Gentiles, the Romans, would hear about Jesus. So Paul is looking at the good that happened. He says, you know, when I was in trial, God was with me. He strengthened me. And through me, the gospel came to all of these people who otherwise would not necessarily have had the opportunity to hear the gospel. So can you imagine Paul in that Roman courtroom? Emperor Nero standing there. He must have had all these ministers there. And you know other people, the soldiers. They think Paul is a great criminal. He might try to sneak away. All of those people standing in the courtroom. And uh, Nero says, Paul, what's happening? And then Paul says, that's my chance. <laughs> and he tells them his whole life story as he's always done. How he encountered Jesus on the road. And up to Damascus. And how Jesus changed his life. The gospel preached in the courtroom. That's the bright side that Paul's looking at. Even though on the other side, he may have felt abandoned, reject, I mean, left alone by people whom he thought should support him at that time. He looks at the positive side. God used it. He was there to strengthen me. And the gospel got in to the Romans, the Gentiles there. And... Uh, and verse 18, so he talks about his expectation. He says, yeah, the same Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. So he says, God's going to preserve me for his kingdom. And we must understand this now in the light of what he has already said. He said, you know, I am going to be sacrificed. I am going to be offered up. But God... It's not going to let this rob me of my faith. It's not going to ruin my faith. He's going to preserve me to his eternal kingdom. God is there. He will take care of it. Verse 19. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. It's very interesting. He's concluding his letter and he's saying, Timothy, I want you to do something. Greet these people for me. Now, Prisca and Aquila, husband and wife team, and Paul puts Prisca, wife first, husband next. <laughs> Priscilla and Aquila. I keep saying Aquila and Priscilla, but Paul writes Priscilla and Aquila. <laughs> puts the wife first, Priscilla and Aquila. Greet them. Now, this, this couple was from Rome. So they were in Rome when Paul wrote his letter to them, the believers in Rome. Later on, because of the persecution uh, in Rome, uh, they were, they, the, the, the Jewish people, the Christians were scattered. And, and, Aquila and Pris Priscilla and Aquila came and joined Paul in Corinth. And they worked with Paul in Corinth and established the church in Corinth. And uh, later on, uh, they moved with Paul to Ephesus, that's Acts 18, and then the Acts 19. They moved with Paul to Ephesus, and they worked with Paul at Ephesus. And they also trained this man named Apollos and sent him back to Corinth. So they were very instrumental in, 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 in nurturing Apollos in the truth and sending him to Corinth. So Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila were there in Ephesus serving. They left Rome, now here serving. Paul remembers their ministry with him. They served in Corinth. They served under Ephesians. He's grateful. And he says, greet them. Same thing about this man named Onesiphorus. We read about him in chapter 1. How when Paul was in Ephesians, Onesiphorus worked alongside Paul. He served Paul. And then more importantly, when Paul was in prison in Rome, Onesiphorus comes all the way to Rome to find out where Paul is and, 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 and serves him there. So now Paul wants to make it a point. He says, thank you. To these people. I think that's important for you and me. As ministers. As people. That we must learn to be thankful. For the people who have blessed our lives. And Paul makes it a point. Greet these people. Convey my greetings. My thanks. They're, they're special. They served with me. They served me. So greet them. Greet 
Crystalline Aquila and Anesiphorus. Verse 20, Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus, I have left in Miletus sick. Now, I want to just make a comment there. That's pretty interesting that Paul would say, I have left one of my co-workers, Trophimus, I've left him sick. Paul, we know as we read through the book of Acts, God used him so powerfully in bringing healing and bringing deliverance to so many people, ministering healing and so on. And yet he says, you know, Here's one person, Trophimus, I've had to, when I left, he was still sick. How do we respond to something like that? How do we take that into account? I want us to understand that Paul ministered the same way you and I minister. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus. Paul didn't have a special magic wand that he could hit people on the head and heal them all. No, he ministered the same way you and I minister in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't know too much of what happened to Trophimus, so we should not speculate. It could have been that a day after Paul left, he got better, got well, or a week after. So we don't know. We don't know what his condition was. We don't know when he recovered. We don't know how long he was sick. So we should not speculate. And a worst thing that we must avoid is to change our theology just because Trophimus, Paul mentioned, I left Trophimus sick. You don't change who God is and you don't change what God has commissioned us to do based on this statement. God is who he said he is. I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord your Healer. Trophimus or Alphemus or, <laughs> or whoever, doesn't matter. God is who he said he is. His nature will not change. And what I say about God will not change. God is still Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. Secondly, we do not change God's commission to us as believers, as the church. He said, go heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. That's what we will do. That commission has not changed. So let's not change our commission. Let's not change our theology just because on this one thing. But we do understand that for whatever reason, we will not always see success like Paul. But that does not change our commission. That does not mean we back off on our commission. It only means we press in and say, God, show us more. Yesterday at the youth camp, strange things happened during the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, we've done baptism of the Holy Spirit services for so many. We do it in our children's church, church, children's camp. We do it in our youth camp. We do it. In, but last night, there was one girl. She would love Jesus. She was a believer, but she started manifesting devils. There was another man who just blacked out. And it took us a while for, for him to come back to his senses. Another young man, we were, you know, we were praying for everyone to be baptized Holy Ghost, but the Holy Spirit came on him powerfully, began to deal with all the unforgiveness, the hurt, and things like God, God was doing something totally different in his life. And I was like, I said, God, and I was, Amy and I, we were talking this morning. I said, you know, so many things happened. I can't figure this out in my mind. So we, on one side, we were casting out devils out of this girl. And the other side, there's a guy who was just totally blanked out, knocked down. And I think he was in that state for at least 20 minutes, maybe longer. And I don't have an explanation. I mean, I was like, God, what actually happened to him? When he came back to his senses, he's like, we asked him, like, what happened to you? He said, no, I just felt something go from me. Uh, beyond that, he had no description, but he was totally knocked out, not responding for more than 20 minutes. And what were we doing? We are just praying for people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Many of them got filled with spirits out of praying in tongues. But in the midst of all the other things were happening. Which, if you ask me, I don't have an answer. All I can say is God is doing as He pleases. I'm only trying to catch up. I'm only trying to understand what is happening. And what was strange was as we were ministering to this girl and several different kinds of demons were coming out of her, one thing that was not coming out, and, we, and, 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 I, began, and I just began to ask, I said, who are you? And, she's, and the, the, the devil was saying, I'm the spirit of a mother. Now, I was like, okay, and I've never been in this kind of a situation before. Spirit of a mother, what's that? So 
I was under the, under the impression, okay, maybe the mother has cast some witchcraft, done some spills, spells and all that. And so I started rebuking that. And, but later on we found out that her parents have died. So I was like, okay, this is something different. And we're always learning, always learning. You can never say, you know, I've probably done deliverance for many, many years. But this is different. Always learning. Something different is happening. Right? So, also in the healing ministry, you can't say you know everything. There's just areas and realms in, in ministry that, that you go in and say, God, I've never been here before, but show me what to do. Show me how to minister. And you're always learning. You go back and say, God, what was that all about? <laughs> what, why did, what, what happened to that young man? What happened to the other guy who was, for 30 minutes, he was crying. And like, nobody could stop him. It's like, what was happening? And then he shared all, all the hurt and the, he, he had been mistreated by his parents. And all that was just coming out. Like, God, that was not what we prayed for. <laughs> we were praying for people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was doing totally something different in that man's life. But thank God he did it. Because that needed to be dealt with in his life. And God knows exactly what needs to be dealt with in each person's life. And we don't have the answers. We just make ourselves available. And so we are constantly learning. And so when it comes to the healing ministry, yes, there will be times when we, we don't see the answer. We see people sick. And, uh, and, and, uh, but you go back to God. Say, God, what, what are we lacking? What is, what is it that we need to do here to see the healing come through, to see the deliverance, to see people blessed and, and, and set free? Because we are always learning. We don't know everything. Amen? But we don't change who God is. We don't change His commission to us as a church. We are on a journey. We are trying to learn. We are trying to discover and, and, and minister out of that. And then finally, Paul closes... Verses 21 and 22, he says, Do your utmost to come before winter. The evil is great to you and others. And, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So the key takeaway here, of course, is 2 Timothy 4.2. He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Be ready. Preach the word. Preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Stay with God's word. Stay with the work of the Spirit. You know, there'll be so many winds of change blowing through the church. And um, I can just tell you what I do as a pastor. As I see what's happening across Christendom, I always go back to the plumb line of God's word. I go back to what the ministry of Jesus and I go back to the book of Acts and say, is that what's happening there? Are we seeing the word of God preached? Are we seeing Jesus exalted? Are we seeing the work of the Holy Spirit with signs, wonders, and miracles? Because that's the standard given to us through the life of Jesus and through the New Testament church in the book of Acts. And that's the church we have to be. That's our original DNA. Amen? We don't deviate from that. So even today... When we have all kinds of strange things blowing through the church and, uh, you know, you've got to evaluate by the word of God. Is it like the book of Acts? Is it what Jesus wanted for his church? I'm going to evaluate everything that happens with that plumb line. We're going to stay true to the word of God. Amen? Let's rise to our feet, please. And Father, we just thank you for your word. And this morning, I just pray, Father, that you will draw our hearts back to the word of God. That, you, that we will be a people who want to hear the truth. Who want to know the word. Want to know you and the presence and the work of your spirit, Father. That God, we will not turn away to the right hand or to the left. From the truth, from your word. But we will be constantly drawing from the truth, from the word, and growing in it, Father. 
And Holy Spirit, we welcome you to work in this place. More upon our hearts, more upon our lives. One of the greatest things you and I can do it is to let go of unforgiveness, to let go of any hatred, any resentment, any grudge that we may be holding against anybody for whatever reason. But we need to let it go. Because Jesus said, when you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. So that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your sins. In Hebrews 12, the writer warns us, he says, Do not let any root of bitterness spring up inside you. Because when it grows up, it will cause you and those around you much trouble. What an amazing thing that Paul could say. All forsook me, but let it not be charged against them. Would you and I just take a few moments to examine our lives and say, you know, if there are people who've hurt me, who wronged me, it could be your parents, it could be family members, it could be friends, it could be colleagues. Would you ask the Lord, God, this morning, help me to forgive. Help me to release all grudge. Let me not hold somebody else responsible for my predicament. Release them. Would you just pray and say, Father, I forgive them. I wipe their slate clean. I wipe it clean. I, I tear up this record of the hurt, of the wrong things, of the injustice. I tear it up. I forgive. Would you also take it? some time just to thank the Lord for people that he's put in your life who've in some way helped you, ministered to you, served with you. Just thank the Lord. And then when you get an opportunity, thank them personally. Father, even in this place, I pray that And you will touch our hearts, our lives. Let there be healing. Let there be freshness coming into our lives. And start so guilty of looking at people through the lens of their past and not seeing them for who they are today. Not giving credit for the growth, the maturity, the change that has taken place in their lives. Would you pray and ask the Lord, Lord help me to change the way I see such and such a person, my perception of so and so. That I'll see them for who they are today. Not who they were five years ago. That I'll not hold their past against them. And Father, change our perception. Change the way we see people. that we will see them for who they are today. We thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. The 
before we close this morning, I want to take a few minutes just to give an invitation for anyone here who has never received Jesus Christ into your life. As we read this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ will stand as the judge. We have to stand before him. But the good news is he came to be our savior. He came the first time to be our savior. He died for your sins and mine. He was buried and he rose up again. And the Bible says if we believe in him, our sins will be forgiven. He'll make us new people. He will make us the children of God. So I want to lead you in a simple prayer. If you've never done this before, if you'd like to call upon the name of Jesus and be saved, have your sins forgiven and become a child of God, I just want to lead you in a simple prayer. Could we just take a moment to pray, please? If you've never done this before, we just pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I believe you died for my sins on the cross. That you rose up again and you're alive today. I ask you to forgive my sins. Make me a child of God. Help me to follow you and you alone for the rest of my life. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's close. Uh, we'll be available for prayer and ministry. If you want us to, uh, we'll be here right after we close. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this morning. And I pray the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, our Father, and the sweet fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with each one of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless each one of you. Have a great Sunday. See you again. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website, apcwo.org, for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.